Section 103 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3 by George W. M. Reynolds. Carlton House. We are now about to relate an incident which, at present, may appear to have little to do with the thread of our narrative, but which we can assure our readers will hereafter prove of immense importance in the development of the tale. On the evening of that day when the innocence of Mr. Torrance was proclaimed, as related in the preceding chapter, King George the Fourth gave a grand entertainment at Carlton House. This splendid mansion was that monarch's favourite residence, not only when he was Prince of Wales and Regent, but likewise while he wore on his unworthy brow the British diadem. Execrable as the character of this unprincipled voluptuary and disgusting debauchee notoriously was, he unquestionably possessed good taste in choosing the decorations of a drawing-room, selecting a paper of a suitable pattern to match particular furniture, and superintending the fittings of a banqueting-hall. Carlton House was accordingly rendered a perfect gem of a palace under his auspices, and there the king loved to dwell, passing his evenings in elegant orgies and his nights in lascivious enjoyment. The interior of Carlton House was indeed most sumptuous in all its arrangements. The state apartments were fitted up with a grandeur properly chastened by elegance, and convenience and comfort were studied as much as magnificence. The entrance hall was paved with veined marble, the roof being supported by ionic columns from the quarries of Siena. The west anteroom contained many fine portraits by Sir Joshua Reynolds, but the most splendid of all the apartments was the crimson drawing-room, which was decorated in the richest and yet most tasteful manner. The rich draperies, the architectural embellishments, the immense pier-glasses, the chandeliers of cut glass, and the massive furniture, all richly gilt, evinced the state of perfection which the arts and manufactures have attained in this country. Adjoining the crimson drawing-room was the rotunda, the architecture of which was of the Ionic order, every part having been selected from the finest specimens of ancient Greece. The ceiling was painted to represent the sky, and was in the shape of a hemisphere, Another beautiful apartment was the rose satin drawing-room, fitted up after the Chinese fashion, and in the middle of which stood a circular table of Sevres porcelain, the gift of Louis the Eighteenth to the king. Many pictures by the old masters likewise embellished that room. We must also mention the blue velvet room, remarkable for the refined taste displayed in its decorations, and the library golden drawing-room, gothic dining-room, bow-room, conservatory, armoury, vestibule, and throne-room, the last of which was fitted up with crimson velvet, and produced when illuminated a superb effect. This rapid glance at the interior of Carlton House may serve to afford the reader a general idea of the splendour of that palace, a splendour almost dazzling to contemplate if we consider it for a few moments in juxtaposition with the deplorable misery of thousands and thousands of cottages, huts, and hovels, in which so large a number of the working population are forced to dwell. But kings and queens care nothing for the condition of their people, so long as their selfish desires can be gratified, and all their childish whims or extravagant caprices can be fulfilled, the industrious millions may rot in their miserable hovels, crushed by the weight of that taxation which is so largely augmented by the wants of royalty. It is absurd to venerate and adore royalty, for royalty is either despicably frivolous or vilely arbitrary, and he who admires or adores it is an enemy to his own interests. Let us, however, return to the subject of this chapter. It was ten at night, and carriage after carriage in rapid succession set down the noble and beauteous guests at the entrance of Carlton House. The palace itself was a blaze of light, and the brilliant lustre 
shed throughout the spacious rooms by the magnificent chandeliers was reflected on the numerous pier glasses and enhanced by the splendour of the diamonds worn by the ladies upwards of four hundred guests constituting the elite of the fashionable world were there assembled and amongst them moved the king himself undoubtedly a polished gentleman although the few the very few qualifications which he did possess have been greatly exaggerated by writers of the lickspittle school it was a reunion of beauty rank and fashion of the most brilliant description though on a limited scale a full band was in attendance and dancing commenced in the drawing-rooms shortly after ten o'clock amongst the guests was the earl of ellingham conspicuous by his fine form and handsome countenance and more deserving of respect on account of his noble nature than by reason of his noble name for a title is a thing which any monarch can bestow but god alone can create the generous heart and the glorious intellect lady hatfield was likewise there for averse as she was to the assemblies of fashion yet having received a card of invitation to this reunion she could not refuse to obey the royal commands and beautiful she appeared too with diamonds sparkling on her hair and in a dress which enhanced the loveliness of her complexion and set off her graceful figure and rounded bust to their utmost advantage she had accompanied the ladies of a noble family with whom she was intimately acquainted and when the party was presented to the king he contemplated lady hatfield with an admiration which he did not attempt to conceal indeed he addressed himself particularly to her during the few minutes that he remained in conversation with the party to which she belonged but other guests speedily demanded his attention and he moved away not however without bestowing another long and even amorous look upon georgiana who felt relieved when the monarch was no longer near the earl was speedily by lady hatfield's side as soon as she was seated and after a few cursory observations upon the entertainment she said to him have you lately visited mr de medina not for the last two or three days he replied i have been kept much at home by the necessity of preparing materials for the speech which i shall have to make on monday evening next on moving according to the notice which i have already given in the house of lords for certain papers calculated to throw some light on the state of the industrious classes you at last intend to shine as a great statesman arthur said lady hatfield with a smile i intend to apply myself to the grand subject of proposing those measures which may ameliorate the condition of millions of human beings answered the earl do you not remember georgiana that i told you how one whose name i need not mention adjured me to do my duty as a british legislator and have you forgotten that i explained to you the deep impression which his language on that occasion made upon me i have forgotten nothing that you ever told me answered lady hatfield and i am rejoiced to hear that you are now seriously resolved to apply your great talents to so useful a purpose you must give the necessary orders to enable me to obtain admittance to the house of lords on monday evening next for i would not for worlds be disappointed in hearing your sentiments upon so grand and important a question if we were not in the light of sister and brother to each other georgiana i should say that i am flattered by your words remarked the earl but as it is i can only assure you that i receive the expression of your desire to be present in the house of lords next monday as a mark of that sincere attachment that profound friendship which you bear towards me and which is so entirely reciprocated and have you reflected upon the conversation which occurred between us the other day relative to miss esther de medina inquired georgiana i have was the answer but as yet i have arrived at no decision the next time you call upon me then said lady hatfield smiling and yet subduing a sigh at the same moment i shall repeat to you all the arguments in that respect which i used on the former occasion now give me your arm and we will walk into the next room through the open folding doors of which i catch a glimpse of some fine paintings to the adjacent apartment they accordingly proceeded 
and inspected several fine pictures, some by the old masters, and others by the most celebrated professors in modern art. While they were thus engaged, the king approached them, greeted the earl with urbane cordiality, and proceeded to point out to Lady Hatfield the best compositions amongst the works which she was admiring. The monarch then proposed that she should visit the armoury, and as, when he had first approached, she had, through deference to royalty, relinquished the arm of the Earl of Ellingham, she was now compelled to accept that of the king. His majesty, however, implied by his manner that Arthur was to accompany them, and the young nobleman accordingly followed the monarch and Georgiana to the armoury. As they passed through the rooms leading thither, many an envious glance was bent upon Lady Hatfield by the wives and daughters of aristocracy, each of whom would have given ten years of her life to obtain so much favour in the eyes of royalty, although the king was, at this period, upwards of sixty-four years of age. There was nevertheless nothing in Lady Hatfield's manner which indicated a consciousness of triumph. Her deportment was modest, yet dignified, and manifesting that ease and self-possession which constitute such important proofs of good breeding. "'This is the first time that I have seen your ladyship at Carlton House,' remarked the king, as they passed slowly on towards the armoury. "'I have never had the honour of visiting your majesty's palace until the present occasion,' was the reply. "'You must not be forgotten in future,' said the king. Then, slightly sinking his voice, he added, a palace is the fitting region to be adorned by beauty such as yours. Lady Hatfield affected not to hear the observation, and the Earl of Ellingham actually did not. I am an enthusiastic admirer of female loveliness, continued the king, and I envy those who possess the talent of portraying upon canvas the features which are most dear to them. By the way, added his majesty, as if a sudden idea had just struck him. I intend to have a Diana painted for my library. Beautiful Lady Hatfield, you must be the original of my Diana. Grant me that favour. I shall esteem it highly. And to-morrow Sir Thomas Lawrence shall call upon your ladyship to receive your commands relative to the first sitting. Your Majesty will deign to excuse me, said Georgiana, in a cold but profoundly respectful tone. "'Indeed, I shall receive no apology,' observed the king, laughing. "'But here we are in the armoury, and it will give me infinite pleasure to direct your attention to those curiosities which are the worthiest of notice.' George the Fourth then pointed out to Lady Hatfield and the Earl of Ellingham the swords which had belonged respectively to the Chevalier Bayard, the great Duke of Marlborough, Louis the Fourteenth, that glorious patriot Hampton, would that we had such a man at the present time, General Moreau, Marshal Luckner, and other heroes. There was also a hunting knife which had belonged to Charles the Twelfth of Sweden, and in addition to these curiosities, there were many military antiquities, especially in costume, all of which the king explained to the lady and the earl. From time to time it struck Lady Hatfield that her royal companion pressed her arm gently in his own, and not in an accidental way, as he addressed himself to her, and he also looked at her more than once in a very peculiar manner. Had he been of a less exalted rank, she would have instantaneously quitted him, but she reflected that it would be an evidence of insane vanity and conceit on her part, were she to interpret in a particular way attentions which after all might have nothing more than a common significancy. She, however, remained cold but respectful, and if the king really meant anything more than the usual courtesy which a gentleman naturally pays to a lady, he received not the slightest encouragement. Ellingham, he said, turning abruptly towards the earl, do you carry a snuff-box? I do not, sire, was the answer. That is provoking. I left mine on the porcelain table in the Chinese drawing-room. The young nobleman understood the hint, bowed and departed to fetch the box, not, however, for a moment suspecting that the king had any sinister motive in sending him away from the armoury 
where his majesty and georgiana now remained alone together for that museum had not been thrown open for the inspection of the guests generally beautiful lady hatfield said george the fourth the moment the folding doors had closed of their own accord behind the earl you will consent to allow lawrence to copy your sweet countenance for my diana your majesty will deign to excuse me was the cold and now reserved answer for georgiana's suspicions previously excited in a faint degree had gathered strength from the fact of her royal companion having got rid of the earl in the manner already described no i will not excuse you beautiful lady exclaimed the king enthusiastically or with affected enthusiasm yours is a countenance which being seen once leaves behind a desire to behold it again and as i shall have no chance of often viewing the original i must content myself with the contemplation of the picture your majesty is pleased to compliment me thus said georgiana more coldly than before and your majesty is of course privileged but such words coming from a less exalted quarter would be deemed offensive i am unfortunate in not being able to render myself agreeable to lady hatfield observed george the fourth drawing himself proudly up to his full height for he was really piqued by the lady's manner he who never sued in vain for a beauteous woman's smiles but probably reflecting that his haughtiness was little suited either to his previous conduct towards georgiana or to his aims with regard to her he immediately unbent again saying in his blandest and most amiable tones not for worlds would i offend you charming lady on the contrary i would give worlds did i possess them to be able to win a single smile from those sweet lips georgiana withdrew her hand from the king's arm and became red with indignation forgive me pardon me said the monarch hastily i perceive that you are vexed with me and i am very unfortunate in having offended you thus speaking he again proffered his arm which lady hatfield took saying would your majesty deign to conduct me back to the company at this moment the earl of ellingham returned to the armoury and handed the king his snuff-box the party then retraced their way to the splendid saloons the monarch conversing the while in a manner which seemed to indicate that lady hatfield had no ground to fear his recurrence to subjects that were disagreeable to her at length he resigned her to the care of lord ellingham but ere he turned away he gave her a rapid and significant look as much as to say i throw myself upon your generosity not to mention my conduct towards you the king now withdrew from the apartments thrown open for the reception of the company and remained absent for nearly an hour when he returned his countenance was much flushed and it was evident that he had been enjoying a glass or two of his favourite curaçao punch in company with a few boon companions who had been summoned to attend him in a private room remote from the state saloons one of the boon companions just alluded to was a certain sir philip warren an old courtier who was supposed to enjoy the confidence of the king and who it was rumoured had been the means of extricating his royal master when prince of wales from many a difficulty in financial matters as well as from the danger of exposure and diverse amatory intrigues without any defined official position about the person of the king sir philip was nevertheless a very important individual in the royal household one of those useful but mysterious agents who while enjoying the reputation of men of honour are in reality the means by which the dirty work of palaces is accomplished in appearance sir philip warren was a stout red-faced good-humoured looking man and not the least of those qualifications which rendered him so especial a favourite with the king was the aristocratic faculty that he possessed of taking his three bottles after dinner without seeming to have imbibed anything stronger than water such was the courtier who accosting the earl of ellingham shortly after the king's return to the drawing-rooms drew that nobleman aside with an intimation that he wished to say a few words to him in private taking the earl's arm sir philip warren led him away from the brilliantly lighted saloons and introduced the nobleman into the blue velvet closet 
a small but elegantly decorated room where a single lamp was burning upon the table his majesty has been speaking to me concerning your lordship said sir philip warren when arthur and himself were seated alone together in the closet indeed our royal master has been graciously pleased to intimate that he is much prepossessed in your favour the earl bowed a cold recognition of the compliment for he was far too enlightened a man not to feel disgust at the sycophantic language in which that compliment was conveyed and he was likewise convinced that there was some ulterior object in view a young nobleman such as your lordship may rise to the highest offices in the state by means of the royal favour continued sir philip your talents are known to be great and your influence in the house of lords is consequently extensive but his majesty regrets to learn that your lordship seems inclined to proclaim opinions so far in advance of the spirit of the age as to be dangerous to the institutions of the country those institutions which the wisdom of our ancestors devised and which the experience of ages has consecrated really sir philip warren said the earl unfeignedly surprised at this address i am at a loss to conceive wherefore you should seek to lead me into a political discussion on such an occasion as the present i will explain myself returned the courtier his majesty retired just now with a few of his faithful servants amongst whom i have the honour to be included to partake of a little refreshment and while we were thus engaged his majesty made an observation highly in favour of yourself a nobleman present thereupon informed his majesty that your lordship had placed a certain notice upon the books of the house of which your lordship is so distinguished an ornament the nature of that notice is displeasing to his majesty who is graciously pleased to think that the common people already consider themselves of far greater importance than they really are if sir by the contemptuous phrase the common people you mean that enlightened and respectable body the working classes exclaimed the earl indignantly i must beg to declare that i differ totally from the opinion which his majesty has expressed concerning them well well my dear earl said sir philip in a conciliatory tone every one has a right to his own opinion we are aware of that fact but permit me to represent to you that you will gain no personal advantage by espousing the cause of the masses i seek no personal advantage cried arthur with an impatient gesture indicative of his desire to terminate the interview at once i am not putting myself forward as a factious demagogue i seek not the honours of a democratic championship but this i intend and contemplate sir philip warren to exert all my energies use all the little influence i may possess and devote any amount of talent which god has given me for the purpose of directing the attention of the legislature to the neglected oppressed and impoverished condition of that fine english people which constitutes the pillar of the state by adopting such a course my lord remonstrated sir philip you will offend his majesty who is now so well disposed towards you that were you inclined to enter his service in the sphere of diplomacy your wishes might be complied with at once indeed the post of envoy plenipotentiary to the important grand duchy of castelcicala is at this moment vacant and if your lordship in one word sir philip warren interrupted the earl of ellingham rising from his seat you are desirous to tempt me into a compromise wherefore do you not frankly explain yourself at once and say withdraw your notice from the books of the house of lords and depart as ambassador to the court of angelo grand duke of castelcicala to which i should immediately reply no possible reward which an earthly monarch can give should induce me to abandon that task which a sense of duty has imposed upon me sir philip warren was astonished at the firmness and boldness with which the earl spoke for such manly independence was quite unusual in the atmosphere of a corrupt court and venal political world the fact was that sir philip had undertaken the task of effecting the desired compromise with the earl the king had specially entrusted the matter to him 
and the courtier trembled at the idea of being compelled to report the total failure of the negotiation to his royal master. He was therefore cruelly embarrassed, and knew not what course to adopt. But suddenly an idea struck him, for he perceived that the earl was not a man to be tempted by reward, but he thought that the nobleman might perhaps be overcome by the powers of eloquent reasoning. "'My dear earl,' he accordingly said, "'you are too honourable and too highly principled a statesman not to yield to conviction. Grant me in common justice one favour. I ask it in the name of his majesty.' "'Speak!' exclaimed Arthur, resuming his chair to show that he was prepared to listen with courteous attention. "'The Prime Minister is present at the reunion this evening,' said Sir Philip. "'Will you hear any argument which he may address to you upon the subject of your notice for next Monday night, and consider whatever may pass between you to be strictly confidential?' I should be unreasonable to refuse to listen to any observations which so high a functionary as the Prime Minister may address to me, answered the Earl, and I shall consider our interview to be private and confidential, on condition that no insult be offered to me in the shape of temptation or promise of reward, if it can be shown by fair argument that I am wrong in pursuing the course which I have adopted, I will yield to conviction." but I shall spurn with contempt and indignation any other means that may be adopted to induce me to withdraw my notice from the books of the house. The interview shall take place upon the condition your lordship has stipulated. Be kind enough to wait my return with the Prime Minister. Sir Philip Warren then withdrew, closing the door behind him. But scarcely had he left the blue velvet closet when the lamp upon the table suddenly grew dim and in a few moments the light expired altogether, doubtless through lack of oil, leaving the room in total darkness. The Earl was uncertain how to act, and while he was still deliberating with himself whether to leave the closet in search of a servant to procure another light, or await the return of Sir Philip Warren, the door opened. "'The room is in darkness, sire,' immediately said a female voice, which the Earl of Ellingham recognised to be that of Lady Hatfield. "'I pledge you my royal word that I was ignorant of the fact when I conducted you hither,' returned the King. "'But pray enter, beauteous lady. We may at all events converse at our ease for a few minutes.' And to the amazement of the Earl, Georgiana complied with the King's request, accompanying His Majesty into that dark room, the door of which was immediately closed. Indeed, so astounded, so shocked was Arthur by this incident, that he sat motionless and speechless in his chair at the further extremity of the apartment. "'My dearest Lady Hatfield,' said the King, "'I thank you most sincerely for having thrown aside that chilling, freezing manner which you maintained in the early part of the evening, when I sought to make you understand the profound admiration with which your beauty has inspired me.' How unfortunate are princes! They cannot obey the dictates of their hearts. They dare not bestow their hand where their affections are engaged. But society is justly lenient in their behalf, and thus the lady who becomes a monarch's favourite is regarded with envy and respect, and not with contumely or reproach. But no lady who entertains the slightest feeling of self-respect observed Lady Hatfield, in a low and tremulous tone, will abandon herself in a moment even to a monarch. There must be proofs of real attachment on his side. Granted, beauteous Georgiana, interrupted the king impatiently. Show me how I can demonstrate my affection towards yourself. Ask me any boon which I have the power to grant, and which I dare accord. "'Oh, if your majesty would only fulfil this pledge!' exclaimed Lady Hatfield joyfully. "'Do you doubt me?' demanded George the Fourth. "'Put me to the test, I say, and you shall be convinced of my readiness, my anxiety to prove how deeply I am attached to you, although the impression made on my heart be so sudden.' "'Sire,' resumed Lady Hatfield, "'I shall be so bold as to take your majesty at your word.' "'Tomorrow your majesty will receive a certain paper, 
and I warn your majesty beforehand that its contents will be most singular. I shall ask no farther explanations than you may choose to give, beauteous Georgiana, observed the king. But when I receive the paper, what next do you require? That your majesty shall affix to it your royal signature, and likewise direct your majesty's secretary of state for the home department to countersign it, responded Lady Hatfield. This being done, the document must be returned to me. All that you have stipulated shall be carried into effect, said the king. Then, sinking his voice and assuming a tender tone, he added, but will there be room for me to hope, sweet lady? Your majesty must remember the observation I made ere now, interrupted Georgiana. Before a woman, whose affection is really worthy of being possessed, can consent to surrender herself entirely, even to one so highly placed as you, sire, her heart must be won by kindnesses shown, by proofs of attachment given. "'I accept the condition implied, charming Georgiana,' exclaimed the king. "'You imagine that I am now influenced by a sudden caprice, "'that the love which I bear for you is the fantasy of a moment. "'Well, I will convince you to the contrary, "'and when I shall have proved to you that my passion survives the passing hour, "'then, then, sweet lady, you will not suffer me to hope in vain. "'Come,' Let us return to the drawing-room, and believe me when I declare that you have made me supremely happy. But ere we again seek that society where a cold ceremony must keep us under a rigid restraint, allow me to seal upon your lips that pledge for which I have already given my royal word. No, sire, not now, not yet, cried Lady Hatfield in a tone which showed that she felt herself to be in a position to dictate to her regal admirer. "'Cruel charmer,' said the king, "'but I suppose you must be permitted to have your own way. Send me the paper to-morrow, let it be addressed to me under cover to Sir Philip Warren, and you shall see, by the haste with which it will be returned to you, that I shall count every minute an hour, and reckon every day to be a year,' until that happy moment comes when you will be wholly and solely mine. George the Fourth then opened the door and led Georgiana away from the room in which this singular scene had taken place. But what of the Earl of Ellingham? So completely stunned and stupefied was he by all that had occurred that he never moved a muscle and retained his very breath suspended while his ears drank in every word that passed between the King and Lady Hatfield. Thus did he become an unwilling and unintentional listener to a discourse which created the most painful emotions in his breast. Was it possible that the Lady Hatfield, whom he looked upon as the very personification of virtue, in spite of the terrible misfortune which had deprived her of her chastity, was it possible that she, whose soul he had imagined to be so pure, though dwelling in a body polluted by the ravisher, was it possible that she had already suffered herself to be dazzled by the delusive overtures of royalty? And was she seriously about to resign herself to the king's arms, to become the mistress of that regal debauchee of sixty-four? "'My God!' thought the earl. "'I, who had such an exalted opinion of female virtue!' Then he remembered that portion of the conversation which had turned upon the document Lady Hatfield was to send to the king for his royal signature, and which she had prepared him to find of a most singular character. Of what nature could that document be? Conjecture was vain and useless. The first impulse of the earl was to inform Lady Hatfield that he had overheard her conversation with the king, and conjure her to reflect seriously ere she committed a fatal step of which she would assuredly have to repent for the remainder of her life. But second thoughts convinced him that he must retain profoundly secret the fact of his acquaintance with the understanding existing between Georgiana and the monarch. For in confessing himself to have been an eavesdropper, he should have to blush in the presence of one whom he was to take to task. He saw it would be difficult to make the lady believe that he himself was so stupefied by her conduct as to be totally unable to declare his presence in a room where a private conversation was in progress, and she would naturally upbraid him, he thought, 
for what might be looked upon as a proof of mean and contemptible curiosity on his part, although, as the reader is aware, he was indeed animated by no such vile sentiment. Moreover, in resigning all claim to her hand, or rather in recognising the impossibility of contracting an alliance with a woman whom his brother had ravished, the earl had ceased to enjoy any right to advise or control her in respect to her moral conduct, and it now struck him that, painfully situated as she was, unable to become the wife of any honourable and confiding man, she had accepted overtures which could render her a monarch's mistress. In a word, he conceived that he should best consult her happiness, as matters stood, by affecting a complete ignorance of the understanding so suddenly established between herself and George the Fourth. Having come to this determination, he quitted the blue velvet closet, and was retracing his way to the scene of brilliant gaiety when he encountered Sir Philip Warren in the corridor. "'I searched everywhere for the minister and was unable to find him,' said the courtier. "'At last, upon making inquiries, I learnt that he had taken his departure.' "'I am not sorry that it is so.' returned the earl of ellingham for i feel convinced that no argument although i should have listened to it as a matter of courtesy could deter me from advocating the cause of the working classes with these words the nobleman bowed coldly to sir philip warren and passed on to the state apartments in one of which he found lady hatfield seated with the friends in whose company she had arrived at the entertainment her manner was calm and collected and if there were any change, it was in the slight, the very slight, smile of triumph which played upon her lips. At least it struck the earl that such an expression her rosy mouth wore, as he approached her. But it disappeared as she began to converse with him, and he so subdued his own feelings that she did not observe anything to lead her to suppose that he was aware of her understanding with the king. Precisely at midnight the supper-rooms were thrown open, and a magnificent banquet was served up. We need scarcely say that the most costly wines, the most expensive luxuries, and every delicacy that gold could procure, appeared upon the board, which absolutely groaned beneath the weight of massive plate, superb porcelain, and brilliant crystal. The festivity was kept up until a late hour. Indeed, it was past two in the morning before the company began to separate. But when the Earl of Ellingham was once more at home, and had retired to his chamber, sleep would not visit his eyes, fatigued though he were. The scene which had occurred in the blue velvet closet was so impressed upon his mind that he could not divert his thoughts into another channel. It was not that he was jealous of Lady Hatfield. No! circumstances had changed his love for her into a sincere and deeply rooted friendship but he felt disappointed he felt deceived in the estimate he had formed of her character he had believed her to be possessed of a mind too strong to be dazzled by the splendours of royalty and to yield herself up to a man whom it was impossible for her to love merely for the sake of becoming a king's mistress had george the fourth been estimable on account of character amiable in disposition, and worthy of admiration as a sovereign, the earl thought that there would in this case have been a shadow, but even then only a shadow, of an excuse for the conduct of Georgiana. The reverse was, however, the precise fact, for the king was notoriously a hardened profligate, a confirmed debauchee, a disgusting voluptuary, and an unprincipled monarch. In a word, such a man as a refined and strong-minded woman would look upon with abhorrence. So thought Lord Ellingham, and when he recalled to memory the frightful behaviour of George the Fourth towards the unhappy Caroline, against whom his vile agents trumped up the most unfounded accusations, and who was hunted to death by the bloodthirsty instruments of a hellish system of persecution, when the Earl reflected upon all this, his amazement at the conduct of Lady Hatfield increased almost to horror. At length his thoughts wandered to Esther de Medina, or rather the beautiful Jewess became mixed up with them, for it was impossible that the scene in the blue velvet closet could be entirely banished from his mind, and as he pondered upon her innocence, her artlessness, 
her amiable qualities his confidence in women revived and he exclaimed aloud as he lay in his sumptuous couch oh wherefore do i delay securing to myself the possession of such a treasure yes esther dearest esther thou shalt be mine End of section 103「Section 104 of the Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Asher. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3 by George W. M. Reynolds. Section 104 An Acquittal and a Sentence the blackamoor in his mysterious abode beheld the successful progress of his grand schemes and while all london was busy with conjectures relative to his daring unknown who seemed to have constituted himself the instrument of justice and the champion of innocence wrongly accused the object of this general interest and curiosity remained in impervious concealment the secretary of state offered a reward of two hundred pounds to any one that should give such information as to lead to the discovery of the person who had enticed sir christopher blount to his unknown abode and who had caused dr lascelles to be conveyed thither by force and the most astute bow street agents were employed in instituting inquiries in every part of the metropolis with a view to find out the dwelling of the individual in question the newspapers teemed with the most absurd and contradictory reports on the subject and a thousand wild rumours were constantly circulating throughout the metropolis the result of all this was that those who were employed in the inquiries above alluded to were so mystified and bewildered that they worked like drunken men in the dark taking up and following any ridiculous information which they obtained either from wags or from persons who wished to appear more knowing than their neighbours and pursuing what at first might seem to be a clue but which invariably led to nothing satisfactory at last the blackamoor's own retainers who were all faithful to their master augmented this confusion by rumours and ideas by mingling amongst the gossips in places of public resort and gravely propagating reports which were sure to direct the attention of the bow street runners from the very point where its object lay and all that dr lascelles had been known to hazard in the shape of conjecture in the matter was a hint that to the best of his belief the carriage in which he had been borne away on the memorable night of the confession had eventually stopped in one of the most easterly suburbs of the metropolis the consequence of the suggestion was that Wapping, Whitechapel, Batnell Green, and Glebe Town were regularly explored by the Bow Street officials, but entirely without success. Although the innocence of Mr. Torrance was universally believed, yet as he had been committed for trial, it was necessary that he should undergo the ordeal. The ceremony took place a few days after the publication of the confession of the real murderers, indeed on the very Monday following the grand entertainment at the Carlton House. The prisoner was arraigned on the charge of having assassinated Sir Henry Courtenay, and the recorder of London presided on the bench. The counsel for prosecution merely stated the particulars of the discovery of the corpse of the deceased baronet and the circumstances which had led to the prisoner's committal. But he did not for a moment insist that those circumstances were conclusive against him. Sir Christopher Blunt then detailed in evidence all that he had given in narrative at Bow Street, and Dr. Lascelles corroborated his statement. The confession signed by Joshua Pedler and Timothy Splint and likewise the one in which martha torrance had attested to certain facts in favour of the prisoner were read by the clerk of arraigns and the counsel for the defence was about to address the court when the jury declared that their minds were already made up 
the acquittal of the prisoner immediately followed and the first person who shook hands with him as he was released from the dock was sir christopher blunt mr torrance accepted a seat in the knight's carriage and repaired to a friend's house in the neighbourhood where clarence villiers adelais rosamond and esther de medina was assembled to welcome his acquittal relative to which none of them had felt at all uneasy but it was evident that although thus relieved from the dreadful charge and appalling danger which had recently hung over him mr torrance was an altered man he had received a blow which had shaken his constitution to its very basis his mental energies were impaired and instead of a hale man of between fifty-five and fifty-six which was his actual age he seemed to be a feeble tottering octogenarian when the excitement produced by the meeting with his family after his release had somewhat subsided mr torrance said with nervous impatience rosamond my dear child i shall leave england this very day will you accompany your father leave us the moment you are restored to us exclaimed adelaide bursting into tears yes yes returned the unhappy man i cannot dare not remain in england though released from a criminal jail yet i am in danger of being plunged into a debtor's prison for i am ruined as you all know totally irredeemably ruined besides never never again could i dwell in that house where so many frightful things have occurred yes he repeated i must leave england at once and you my poor rosamond he added with tears trickling down his sunken cheeks will have to support your father by means of your accomplishments in a foreign land no that must not be said esther de medina passing a handkerchief rapidly over her eyes rosamond has friends to whom although they have known her but for so short a period her welfare is dear foreseeing some such decision as that to which you have now come relative to leaving england my father has desired me to place a thousand pounds at your daughter's disposal continued the beautiful jewess addressing herself to the wandering torrents and at the same time placing a sealed packet in rosamond's hands oh my generous my excellent-hearted friend exclaimed rosamond embracing the jewess tenderly how is it possible that i could have merited this kindness this extraordinary bounty at your hands we are fellow-creatures though of a different creed said esther modestly but she was compelled to receive the thanks of the astonished torrents and of the admiring clarence and adelaide villiers now drew his father-in-law aside and spoke to him concerning mrs torrents i cannot see her clarence i cannot meet her again he replied besides an interview would be useless our marriage was not one of affection as you are well aware and moreover but he added suddenly interrupting himself and looking tremblingly in the young man's face while his voice sang to a low hollow whisper she has doubtless told you all and then he glanced towards rosamond who was conversing with esther de medina and adelaide at the farther end of the room yes i know all returned villiers and the word seemed to convulse his wretched listener with horror but it is too late to amend the past and it is not for me to reproach you now your own conscience mr torrance will prove a sufficient punishment for the frightful wrong you have done to that poor girl and fear not that i shall impart the sickening truth to my wife who is already too deeply affected by all that has lately occurred thank you clarence thank you at least for that assurance said the old man his voice almost suffocated with terrible emotions you perceive how impossible it is that i should remain in england with so many dreadful reminiscences to make me ashamed to look those who know me in the face this very instant will rosamond and myself set out on our way to a foreign land you'll be kind enough to send my trunks after me to dover i do not attempt to dissuade you from the step observed villiers because i can see no more agreeable alternative mr torrance's decision was then communicated to the three ladies and the farewell scene between the sisters was affecting in the extreme no less did adelaide deplore the necessity which compelled her to separate from her father 
but she at least had a consolation in the midst of her grief a solace in the possession of a husband who loved her devotedly whom she adored a post-chaise was speedily in attendance and mr torrance took his departure from the english capital in company with his younger daughter esther de medina did not take leave of clarence and adlas before she had made them promise to pay her an early visit at finchley manor and the young couple returned to torrance cottage more than ever prepossessed in favour of the beautiful jewess who seemed to delight only in doing good on the ensuing day martha torrance was placed in the dock before the recorder of london charged with the crime of forgery the court of old bailey was crowded with persons belonging to those religious associations of which the prisoner had lately been so conspicuous a member there was mr jonathan puckwash president of the south sea islands bible circulating society not only with a face indicative of its owner's attachment to brandy but also with a breath smelling very strongly of that special liquor there also was the reverend malachi sawkins looking so awfully miserable at the scandal brought by the prisoner's conduct on the religious world that a stranger would have supposed him to be at least her brother if not her husband and there likewise was the reverend mr sheepshanks who having made his peace with the members of the above-mentioned society had latterly come out much stronger than ever in the shape of a saint many other sleek and oily or thin and pale religious gentlemen were present on this occasion and in the gallery were numerous old ladies all belonging to the ultra evangelical school who appeared to divide their attention between the task of wiping their eyes with the white cambric handkerchiefs and strengthening their nerves by means of frequent applications to little flasks or bottles which they took from their pockets or muffs mrs torrance was supported into the dock by two turnkeys of newgate for she was overcome with shame and grief at the position in which her crime had placed her she was indeed a pitiable object and it was evident that whatever penalty the bench might award her punishment in this world had already begun the indictment being read she pleaded guilty in a faint voice and the prosecutors strongly recommended her to mercy the recorder put on the black cap and proceeded to address the prisoner in a most feeling manner his lordship said that the law left him no alternative but to pronounce sentence of death he however observed that considering the contrition manifested by the plea of guilty and the intercession of the bankers who had been defrauded of their money by the forgery he should recommend the prisoner to the mercy of the crown his lordship concluded by an intimation that she must make up her mind to pass the remainder of her days as an exile in the penal settlements but that her life would be spared she was conveyed in a fainting state away from the dock and the religious gentleman present gave so awful and simultaneous a groan that the judge was quite startled upon the bench and the jury were horrified in their box at the period of which we are writing this high civic functionary tried cases involving capital penalties as well as those of a less serious nature since the establishment of the central criminal court the great judges of the kingdom preside at the old bailey to try prisoners charged with grave offences end of section one o four recording by Asher. Section 105 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Chapter 99. The Condition of the Working Classes. In the afternoon of that same Monday on which Mr. Torrens was acquitted and his wife condemned, vast crowds collected in the vicinity of the Houses of Parliament. The multitude consisted chiefly of members of the industrious classes, many individuals being accompanied by their wives and children. They were attired in the best raiment that they possessed, and their conduct was most orderly and creditable. 
At about a quarter to five o'clock the carriages began to arrive and set down at the respective entrances the members of the two Houses of Parliament. Some, however, proceeded thither on horseback, and others on foot. The crowds neither cheered the popular nor hissed the unpopular legislators who thus passed through the mass which had divided to make way for them, until at last one long, hearty, and glorious outburst welcomed the appearance of the Earl of Ellingham, as he proceeded on horseback attended by his groom to St. Stephen's. The young nobleman acknowledged this outpouring of a people's gratitude, not with a patronizing condescension, but with an affability which seemed to say, I am one of yourselves, we're all equal, and I am proud of being considered your friend. Long after he had entered the portals of the House of Lords, and was lost to the public view, did the cheering continue outside, for the multitudes appreciated all that was great and generous in the task which a member of a proud aristocracy had undertaken to perform that day in their behalf. There was a full attendance of peers, temporal and spiritual, and the strangers' galleries overlooking the throne and the woolsack were crowded with fashionable gentlemen and elegantly dressed ladies. Amongst the audience there assembled were Lady Hatfield, Mr. de Medina, and Esther Georgiana was not, however, seated near the Jew and his daughter, she being unacquainted with them otherwise than by name, as the reader is already aware. Soon after five o'clock the Earl of Ellingham arose from his seat, advanced towards the table, and proceeded to address the house on the motion of which he had given notice. He began by expressing a regret that so important a subject as that which he proposed for discussion, namely the condition of the industrious population, should not have been taken up by some noble lord more competent than himself to do it adequate justice. And he declared most solemnly that no selfish idea of obtaining popularity had influenced him in the course which he was pursuing. He then proceeded to expatiate upon the state of the working classes, and to urge upon the House the necessity of adopting measures to ameliorate their lamentable condition. It was too frequently alleged, he observed, that those classes were thoughtless, improvident, ungrateful, and intellectually dull. But this assertion he emphatically denied. Despair, produced by their unhappy condition, naturally led to dissipation in many instances. But were the working man placed in a position so that his livelihood should be rendered less precarious than it now was, were his labor adequately remunerated, were he more fairly paid by the representatives of property, were a scale of wages established having a fixed minimum, but no fixed maximum, the increased comfort thus ensured to him would naturally remove from his mind those cares which drove him to the public house. His lordship would have no fixed maximum of wages, because wages ought always to be increased in proportion to the value of productive labor to employers. But he would have a minimum established to obviate the cruel and disastrous effects of those periods when labor exceeded the demand in the market. This could not be considered unfair towards employers, because when the markets were brisk and trade was flourishing, they, the employers, reaped the greatest benefit from that activity and enrich themselves in a very short time. Therefore, when markets were dull and trade was stagnant, they should still be compelled to pay such wages as would enable their employed to live comfortably. The profits gained during prosperous seasons not only enabled employers to enjoy handsome incomes, but also to accumulate considerable savings, and as the best wages scarcely enabled the employed to make anything like an adequate provision for periods of distress, it was not fair that the representatives of property should use the labor of the working classes just when it suited them, and discard it, or only use it on a miserable recompense when it did not so well suit them. For the labor of the employed not only made annual incomes for the employers, but also permanent fortunes, and the value of that labor should not be calculated as lasting only just as long as it was available for the purpose of producing large profits. Labor was the working man's capital and should have constant interest as well as money placed in the funds, that interest, of course, increasing in proportion to the briskness of markets, but never depreciating below a standard value, much less being discarded as valueless altogether in times of depression. A thousand pounds would always obtain three per cent interest under any circumstances, and at particular periods might be worth six or seven per cent. Labor should be considered in the same light. Stagnant markets diminished the profits of employers, but did not ruin them. If they did not obtain profit enough to live upon, they had the accumulation of good seasons to fall back upon. 
but how different was the case with the employed to them stagnation of business was ruin starvation death the breaking up of their little homes the sudden check of their children's education the cause of demoralization and degradation and the terrible necessity of applying to the parish the supply and demand of labor were necessarily unequal at many times and in many districts and the government should therefore adopt measures to prevent those frightful fluctuations in wages which carried desolation into the homes of thousands of hard-working industrious and deserving families in fact a law should be passed to ensure the working man against the casualty of being employed at a price below remuneration in england the poor were not allowed to have a stake in the country there were no small properties the land was in the possession of a few individuals comparatively and thus the landed interest constituted a tremendous monopoly most unjust and oppressive to the industrious classes the only way to remove this evil influence and ameliorate the condition of the working population the only way to countervail the disastrous effect of that monopoly short of a revolution which would treble or quadruple the number of landed proprietors was to compel property to maintain labor as long as labor sought for employment and occupation the noble earl then proceeded to state that if the working classes were thus treated they would not be driven by their cares and troubles to the excessive use of alcoholic liquors they would not become demoralized by being compelled to migrate from place to place in search of employment going upon the tramps sleeping in hideous dens of vice where numbers were forced to herd together without reference to age or sex they would not be unsettled in all their little arrangements to bring up their children creditably and with due reference to instruction they would not be made discontented anxious for any change no matter what vindictive towards that society which thus rendered them outcasts and sullen or reckless in their general conduct but as things now were the industrious man never felt settled he knew that the hut which he called his home was held on the most precarious tenure he felt the sickening conviction that if he had bread and meat to-day he might have only bread to-morrow and no food at all the day after it was positively frightful to contemplate the condition of mental uncertainty anxiety and apprehension in which millions of persons were thus existing and those who reproached them with recklessness or sullenness should blame themselves as the causes of all that they vituperated lord ellingham next proceeded to show that although there had been a vast increase of wealth and comfort amongst the middle and upper classes yet the condition of the industrious millions was not only unimproved but had positively deteriorated the population was increasing at the rate of one thousand souls a day and pauperism was keeping pace with that increase unrepresented in parliament without any means of making their voice heard positively incapacitated from having a stake in the country the industrious millions were the mere slaves and tools of the wealthy classes thus an immense mass of persons was kept in bondage in absolute serfdom by an oligarchy was such a state of things just was it rational was it even humane the millions were ground down by indirect taxes in which shape they actually contributed more to the revenue in proportion to their means than the rich the only luxuries which the poor enjoyed and which had become as it were necessaries namely tea sugar tobacco beer and spirits were the most productive sources of revenue if noble lords reproached the poor for dirty habits as well he knew that it was their custom to do he would ask them why soap was made an article subject to so heavy a tax it was a contemptible fallacy to suppose that because the poor contributed little or nothing in the shape of direct taxation to the revenue they were positively untaxed he would again declare that the poor paid more in indirect taxes than the rich did in both direct and indirect ways when the relative means of the two parties were taken into consideration from these subjects the earl passed to the consideration of the inequality of the laws and the incongruity severity and injustice of their administration towards the poor every advantage was given to the rich in the way of procuring bail in those cases where security for personal appearance was required but no poor man could possibly give such security he must go to prison and there heard with felons of the blackest dye perhaps on trial his innocence would transpire and then what recompense had he for his long incarceration his home broken up during his absence and his ruined family it was possible nay it often happened that a man would lie thus in prison for four or five months previously to trial and during that period it would be strange indeed if he escaped jail contamination 
Then again, there were offences of a comparatively venial kind, and for which penalties might be inflicted in the shape of fines, the alternative being imprisonment. These fines were insignificant trifles in the estimation of a rich man, but the smallest of them was quite a fortune in the eyes of the poor. Even a person with a hundred a year would pay a fine of five pounds rather than go to prison for a month or six weeks. But a laboring man earning ten or twelve shillings a week could no more satisfy the demand thus made upon him than he could influence the motion of the earth, unless indeed he pawned and pledged every little article belonging to him, and the infliction thereby became a blow which he never afterwards recovered. Did a poor man offend a clergyman? He was forthwith put into the spiritual court, as the common saying was, and the expensive proceedings which he could not stay involved him in utter ruin. When a poor man was oppressed by a rich one, it was vain and ludicrous to assert that the courts of law were open to him. Law was a luxury in which only those who possessed ample means could indulge. In a case where some grievous injury was sustained by a poor man, the seduction of his wife or daughter, for instance, redress or recompense was impossible unless some attorney took up the case on speculation, and this was a practice most demoralizing and pernicious. But if left entirely unassisted in that respect, the poor man could no more go to Westminster Hall than he could afford to dine at Long's Hotel. With regard to the subject of education, the noble Earl declared that it was positively shocking to think that such care should be taken to convert Negroes to Christianity thousands of miles off, while the most deplorable ignorance prevailed at home. The church enjoyed revenues the amount of which actually brought the ministers of the gospel into discredit, as evidencing their avaricious and grasping disposition while the people remained as uneducated as if not a single shilling were devoted to spiritual pastors or lay instructors. He boldly accused both houses of Parliament and the upper classes generally of being anxious to keep the masses in a state of ignorance. Where instruction was imparted gratuitously it was entirely of a sectarian nature, just as if men required to study grammar, history, arithmetic, or astronomy on the Church of England principles. The whole land was overrun by clergymen who lived upon the fat of it. Universities and public schools had been richly endowed for the purpose of propagating knowledge and encouraging learning, and yet the people were lamentably ignorant. It was a wicked and impudent falsehood to declare that they were intellectually dull or averse to mental improvement. Common sense, that best of sense, was the special characteristic of the working classes, and those who could read were absolutely greedy in their anxiety to procure books newspapers and cheap publications for perusal the fact was that the mind of the industrious population was a rich soil wherein all good seed would speedily take root shoot up and bring forth fruit to perfection but the apprehensions or narrow prejudices of the upper classes the oligarchy would not permit the seed to be sown now as the soil must naturally produce something even of its own accord it too often gave birth to rank weeds and this was made a matter of scorn, reviling, and reproach. But the real objects of that scorn, the reviling, and that reproach, were those who obstinately and wickedly neglected to put the good soil to the full test of fertilization. Lastly, the Earl of Ellingham directed attention to the state of the criminal laws. These were only calculated to produce widely spread demoralization, to propagate vice, to render crime terribly prolific. A man, no matter what his offense might have been, should be deemed innocent and untainted again when he had paid the penalty of his misdeed, because to brand a human being eternally was to fly in the face of the Almighty and assert that there should be no such thing as forgiveness, and was no such thing as repentance. But the nature of punishments in this country was so to brand the individual, and so to dare the majesty of heaven. For the jails were perfect nests of infamy, sinks of iniquity imprisonment in which necessarily fastened an indelible stigma upon the individual. He either came forth tainted, or else it was supposed that he must be so. Under these circumstances he vainly endeavored to obtain employment, and utterly failing in his attempt to earn an honest livelihood, he was compelled perforce to relapse into habits of crime and lawlessness. This fact accounted for an immense amount of the demoralization which the bishops so much deplored but the true causes of which they obstinately refused to acknowledge. The criminal jails were moral pest-houses, in which no cures were effected, but where the contagious malady became more virulent. Society should not immure offenders solely for the sake of punishment, but with a view to reformation of character. 
the noble earl then summed up his arguments by stating that he was anxious to see measures adopted for a minimum rate of wages to prevent the sudden fluctuation of wages and to compel property to give constant employment to labor he was desirous that indirect taxes upon the necessaries of life should be abolished he wished the laws and their administration to be more equitably proportioned to the relative conditions of the rich and the poor he insisted upon the want of a general system of national education to be entrusted to laymen and to be totally distinct from religious instruction and sectarian tenets he desired a complete reformation in the system of prison discipline and explained the paramount necessity of founding establishments for the purpose of affording work to persons upon leaving criminal jails as a means of their obtaining an honest livelihood and retrieving their characters prior to seeking employment for themselves and he hoped that the franchise would be so extended as to give every man who earned his own bread by the sweat of his brow a stake and interest in the country's welfare the noble earl wound up with an eloquent peroration in which he vindicated the industrious millions from the aspersions misrepresentations and calumnies which it seemed to be the fashion for the upper classes to indulge in against them and he concluded by moving a number of resolutions in accordance with the heads of his oration the earl's speech was received with very partial cheering by the assembled lords to whom its tenor was most unpalatable but such was its effect upon the auditors in the strangers galleries that contrary to the established etiquette it was loudly applauded by them the lord chancellor immediately called to order and in a few minutes a dead silence reigned throughout the house the leading minister present then rose to answer the earl's oration which he did in the usual style adopted by official men under such circumstances entirely blinking all the main arguments he declaimed loudly in favor of the prosperity of the country dwelt upon the happiness of english cottagers lauded the wisdom of our ancestors uttered the invariable cant about our glorious institutions spoke of church and state as if they were siamese twins whom it would be death to sever and after calling upon the house to resist the earl of ellingham's motion sat down several noble lords and right reverend fathers in god took part in the discussion and at length the house divided when the earl's motion was of course lost by an overwhelming majority against it arthur was by no means disappointed he had foreseen this result but he had made up his mind to renew the subject as often as he could in the full hope that a steady perseverance would ultimately be crowned with success the house adjourned the strangers galleries were speedily cleared and the lords spiritual and temporal rolled home in their carriages the multitudes who still remained assembled in the vicinity of st stephen's preserving a profound silence until the earl of ellingham was observed to issue forth by those persons who were nearest to the lord's entrance then arose a shout more loud more hearty even than that which had greeted his arrival a few hours previously it was the voice of a generous and grateful people expressing the sincerest thanks for the efforts which the noble patriot had exerted in their cause end of section 105 recording by philip gould section 106 of the mysteries of london volume 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds The Earl of Ellingham and Esther de Medina It was about two o'clock in the afternoon of the day following the scene just described that the Earl of Ellingham and Esther de Medina were walking in the gardens attached to Finchley Manor. The beautiful Jewess leant upon the arm of that fine young nobleman, who had suddenly appeared before the world in the light of the champion of the industrious classes. Never had Esther seemed so ravishingly lovely as on this occasion. A rich carnation hue tinged her cheeks beneath the clear, transparent olive of her complexion, and her fine, large black eyes mirrored the enthusiasm of her soul as she listened to her companion who was expatiating upon the wrongs and sufferings endured by the sons and daughters of toil her generous heart beat in entire sympathy with his own in this respect until the previous evening she had known little more of the condition of the people than is generally gleaned by young ladies of good education from the works which they peruse 
but the earl's lucid and convincing exposure had shed a marvellous light upon her soul she comprehended how much the industrious millions were neglected by the government how sorely they were oppressed by a selfish grasping greedy oligarchy how noble a task it was which the earl had imposed upon himself his brilliant eloquence his logical reasoning the tone of deep conviction in which he had spoken the conscientious earnestness of his manner and the honest fervour that animated him when having disposed of the more argumentative portion of his speech he burst forth in his impassioned peroration all this had made a profound impression upon esther de medina for hitherto her gentle heart had loved him for all those qualities of person qualities of person and of mind which usually engender tender feelings in the maiden's bosom but now she felt that she could adore him that she could worship him as a hero who had stood forth in honest championship of a cause which it was so glorious to undertake therefore was it that her cheeks were tinged with the carnation glow of youthful enthusiasm therefore was it that her fine dark eyes flashed with the fires of so generous a fervour as she now dwelt upon every word that the nobleman was uttering in reiteration of those sentiments which he had so boldly enunciated the night before but by degrees the conversation took a different and more tender turn and as they entered an avenue of trees verdant with the foliage of an early spring the nobleman found himself speaking in obedience to those feelings of admiration which he experienced towards the beautiful jewess it was not to treat you with a political disquisition miss de medina said the earl that i came hither to-day i had another and very different object in view for i am about to ask you to bestow upon me a boon which if accorded shall ever ever be most highly prized esther dearest esther added the nobleman sinking his voice to a tender whisper and gazing upon her affectionately it is this fair hand which i solicit oh my lord murmured esther casting down her swimming eyes while she felt that her cheeks were burning with blushes you have not well considered the step which you are now taking i have reflected deeply upon the course which i am adopting answered the nobleman and i am convinced that my happiness depends upon your reply tell me esther dearest can you love me will you accept me as your husband did i consult only my own heart my lord replied the beautiful jewess her countenance still suffused in virgin blushes and her voice tremulously melodious i should not hesitate how to reply oh how could i but i cannot forget my lord that i am the daughter of a despised a persecuted a much maligned race that the prejudices of your country and your creed are hostile to such an alliance as this the proposal of which has done me so much honour you are well aware my beloved esther said the earl that i have none of those absurd prejudices the proudest christian who wears a crown might glory in being the son-in-law of such a man as mr de medina and even were he otherwise than what he is it were a worthy aim of ambition to become the husband of his daughter esther i am well aware my lord resumed esther that your heart harbours every noble and ennobling sentiment that you are all that is great and liberal and good proud and happy then must that woman esteem herself who shall be destined to bear your name but not for me my lord not for the despised jewess must that supreme honour be reserved no she continued her voice faltering and her bosom heaving convulsively no my lord it may not be esther exclaimed the earl of ellingham in an impassioned tone tell me i conjure you is this the only motive which induces you to hesitate is it simply on account of those absurd prejudices 
which my illiberal fellow countrymen entertain in reference to your race is it solely on this account that you deny me the boon i demand that reason and another murmured the lovely jewess in a low hesitating and tremulous tone ah that other i can divine it cried the young nobleman you know that i was engaged to lady hatfield but that engagement exists no longer has ceased to exist for some time i will not attempt to persuade you dearest esther that i did not love georgiana but i now feel that my passion in respect to her was very different from the affection which i entertain for you georgiana was the idol of my imagination you are the mistress of my soul my attachment to her was wild and passionate to you it is tender and profound dazzled by her splendid beauty i was bewildered captivated held in thraldom but such a love as that contained not those elements which might render it durable your modest and retiring charms sweet esther your amiability your gentleness your goodness all combine to render my love permanent and impossible to undergo diminution or change moreover circumstances which i need not cannot explain to you suddenly transpired to alter my sentiments in respect to lady hatfield to make me look upon her as a sister and never more in any other light but if you will give me your love my esther you shall experience all the happiness which can arise from an alliance with one who will make your welfare the study of his life indeed if you still hesitate on the score of those prejudices to which we just now alluded then sooner than resign my hope of possessing this fair hand of yours i will renounce the society in which i have been accustomed to move i will dwell with you when heaven's blessing shall have united us in some charming seclusion where we shall be all in all to each other i will devote myself entirely to you and to that task which i have taken upon myself in respect to the industrious classes that fine english people in whom my sympathies are so deeply interested oh my lord murmured esther in a joyous though subdued tone how have i merited all the proofs of attachment which you now lavish upon me how can the obscure jewess flatter herself that she is worthy of becoming the bride of one of england's mightiest nobles then you do consent to become mine esther cried the handsome young peer and reading her answer in her eloquent eyes he caught her in his arms and pressed her to his heart and on her virgin lips he imprinted the first kiss which esther had ever received from mortal man save her own father a few minutes elapsed in profound silence a few minutes during which the happy pair exchanged glances of sincere and pure and hallowed love suddenly the sound of footsteps drawing near fell upon their ears they turned and beheld mr de medina approaching down the avenue of trees then the earl of ellingham taking esther's hand advanced towards the jew and said in a firm and manly tone mr de medina i am glad that you have come hither at this moment for i have a great boon to beg of you a precious gift to solicit and he glanced tenderly towards the blushing maiden who stood by his side i understand you my dear arthur returned mr de medina smiling but i presume that the whole business is already settled and arranged between you he added looking slyly and benignantly at his daughter miss de medina has consented to bestow her hand upon me my dear sir answered the nobleman and i scarcely dread a refusal on your part a refusal ejaculated mr de medina the tears of joy and gratitude starting to his eyes there is indeed no danger of that on whom would i consent to bestow my jewel my pride if not upon you you my dear arthur 
who are all that an Englishman ought to be. Yes, I give you my daughter, and may God ensure your happiness. The venerable Jew embraced the Earl and Esther, and the happiness of those three deserving and admirable persons was complete. The Earl of Ellingham passed the remainder of that day at Finchley Manor, and it was past eleven o'clock in the evening when he alighted from his carriage at the door of his own abode. On the ensuing morning, Clarence Villiers called upon the nobleman, by whom he was most courteously received, and the Earl proceeded to explain to him the nature of the business which had induced him to request the favour of that interview. Mr. Villiers, said Arthur, it will be sufficient for me to inform you that I had reasons for experiencing a more than common interest in behalf of Thomas Rainford, with whom you were somewhat intimately acquainted. What those precise reasons were, you as a gentleman will not inquire, but I believe that you have in your possession a particular letter which Thomas Rainford entrusted to you, and circumstances now render it necessary that this document should pass from your hands into mine. The high character of your lordship commands immediate compliance on my part, said Villiers, producing the letter from his pocket-book and tendering it to the earl. I thank you for this proof of confidence, Mr. Villiers, observed the nobleman, but to set your mind completely at rest, I can show you a written authorization signed by Thomas Rainford, to enable me to receive the paper from you. "'It is not at all necessary, my lord,' answered Clarence, rising to take his departure. "'One moment,' said the Earl, much struck by the frank, candid, and gentlemanly demeanour of Villiers. "'Anyone who felt an interest in Thomas Rainford, especially one in whom he reposed sufficient confidence,' to entrust with that letter, has a claim on my friendship. I should therefore be delighted to serve you, Mr. Villiers, and let this assurance tend to convince you that I am animated by no idle curiosity in inquiring relative to your position in life. I believe you hold a situation in Somerset House? Villiers answered in an affirmative. And the salary you at present receive is only ninety or a hundred pounds a year, continued the Earl. You see that Thomas Rainford has made me acquainted with your circumstances, and that I have not forgotten them. Indeed, he requested me to exert myself in your behalf, and I am anxious to fulfil his desire. I called at your lodgings in Bridge Street, and learned that you had been very recently married. Now, ninety or a hundred pounds a year, continued the Earl, with a smile, are little enough to enable you to support your changed condition in comfort, and the state of political parties forbids me to ask any favours of the men in power. I will make you a proposal, which you may take time to reflect upon. I require a private secretary, and that post I offer to you. The emoluments are four hundred a year, and a house rent-free. The dwelling is a beautiful cottage belonging to me, and situate at Brompton. Moreover, I will give you three hundred guineas for your outfit and furniture. Clarence Villiers was astonished, nay, perfectly astounded, by the liberality of this offer, and, unable to utter a word, he gazed upon the Earl with eyes expressive of the most sincere gratitude mingled with admiration at his generous behaviour. "'I know,' resumed the Earl, "'that a government situation is a certainty, and that you have every chance of rising in your present sphere. Think not, therefore, that I now offer you a precarious employment. No, whether I continue in that activity of political existence on which I have just entered, or whether I be compelled by circumstances to renounce it, you shall be duly cared for. My lord, I accept your generous proposal, exclaimed Clarence, at length recovering the power of speech, and I shall exert myself unweariedly 
to deserve your lordship's good opinion of me. The bargain is therefore concluded, said the nobleman. I will give you a note to my solicitor, who will immediately put you in possession of the lease of the house at Brompton. The earl seated himself at a writing table, and penned the letter to his professional agent. He also wrote a cheque on his banker's for three hundred guineas, and the two documents he handed to Clarence Villiers, who took his leave of the kind-hearted nobleman, his soul overflowing with emotions of gratitude and admiration. How joyous, oh, how joyous a thing it is to carry glad tidings to the beloved of one's bosom, to hasten home to a fond, confiding, adoring wife, and be able to exclaim to her, the smiles with which thou greetest me, dearest, will not be chased away from thy sweet lips by the news which I have in store for thee, for God is good to us, my angel, and happiness, prosperity, and buoyant hopes are ours. From comparative poverty we are suddenly elevated to the possession of affluence, and we enjoy the protection of one who will never desert us, so long as we pursue the paths of rectitude and honour. Oh, to be enabled to say this to a loved and loving creature is happiness ineffable, and that felicity was now experienced by Clarence Villiers, and shared by his charming wife. Wealth in the hands of such a man as the Earl of Ellingham was like anodynes in the professional knowledge of the physician who attends the poor gratuitously. The power to do good is the choicest of the unbought luxuries of life, and far more delicious than all the blandishments that gold can procure. From the midst of a selfish and bloated aristocracy, how resplendently did the Earl of Ellingham stand forth as a glorious example of generosity, manliness, and moral worth. He was the true type of the sterling English gentleman, an Englishman of education, enlightened soul, and liberal sentiments. Not one of those narrow-minded beings who believe that birth and wealth are the only aristocracy, and whose ideas are limited as the confines of the land to which they belong. Your prejudiced Englishman is a most contemptible character, borrowing so much as he does from foreign nations, even to the very fashion of his coat and hat, or his wife's gown. He boasts in his absurd and pompous pride that England is all and everything in itself. Britain is indeed a wonderful country, but Britain is not the whole world, after all. In all that is useful, as far as the solid comforts of life are concerned, she stands at the head of civilization, but she cannot compete with France in the refinements and elegancies of existence, nor in the progress of purely democratic principles. If Great Britain be a wonderful country, the French are a wonderful, ay, and a mighty and noble nation likewise and in France at least the principles of equality are well understood, and the battering ram of two revolutions has knocked down hereditary peerage, class distinctions, religious intolerance, and that vile prestige, which makes narrow-minded Englishmen quote the wisdom of their ancestors as a reason for perpetuating the most monstrous abuses. But let us return to the Earl of Ellingham, who, having terminated his interview with Clarence Villiers, repaired to the dwelling of Lady Hatfield. Georgiana was at home, and Arthur was immediately admitted to the drawing-room, where she was seated. He had not now the same feelings of pleasure which had lately animated him when entering the presence of one whom he had sought to love as a sister. The scene at Carlton House haunted him like an evil dream, and as he contemplated the calm and tranquil demeanour of Georgiana, he felt grieved at the idea that beneath this composure must necessarily reign the excitement experienced by a woman who had resolved on becoming the king's mistress. Nevertheless, in pursuance of the resolutions already established in his mind, he conquered, or rather concealed, his sentiments, and though a bad hand at anything resembling duplicity of conduct, he managed to greet her without exhibiting anything peculiar in his manner. 
"'I have two important communications to make to you, Georgiana,' he said, as he seated himself opposite to her. "'The first relates to a delicate subject, which we will dispose of as soon as possible. "'In a word, I have this morning seen Mr. Villiers, and he has given me this paper.' Lady Hatfield eagerly received the document from the hands of the nobleman, and ran her eyes rapidly over it. Her countenance grew deadly pale, and tears trickled down her cheeks as she murmured in a tone of subdued anguish, "'My God! They were in want! They were starving! That woman and my child! And I—' Then, stopping suddenly short, she threw herself back upon the sofa, covered her face with her hands, and no longer sought to repress the outpourings of her grief. The Earl interrupted her not. He understood the nature of those emotions, which constituted a subject of self-reproach on the part of the unhappy lady, who was so deeply to be commiserated, and he thought within himself, She possesses a kind, a feeling heart. At length Georgiana broke the long silence which prevailed. Yes, there can be no doubt, she exclaimed. That boy is my child, and he is now with his father. May heaven bless him. Rest assured that he is with one who will treat him kindly, although some weeks must elapse ere he can learn who the boy really is, observed the Earl of Ellingham. And now for the second communication which I have to make to you, Georgiana, continued the nobleman desirous to change the topic as speedily as possible. "'I have taken your advice. I have followed your counsel.' "'And Esther de Medina is to become the Countess of Ellingham?' said Lady Hatfield, in a low and mournful tone of voice. "'Esther has consented to be mine,' added the Earl, "'and her father has expressed his joy and delight at the contemplated alliance.' For a few moments Georgiana turned aside her head, and appeared to struggle violently and painfully with the emotions which filled her bosom. "'Arthur,' she said at last, evidently scarcely able to stem the flood of her agitated feelings, "'I am happy to learn these tidings. You will be blessed in the possession of one who has been represented to me in such an amiable, such an estimable light. I congratulate you.' and her likewise you deserve all the felicity which this world can give and she who is destined to be your bride added georgiana tremulously must feel proud of you yes arthur your high character your talents your generous disposition your noble nature she could say no more in summing up all his good qualities she seemed to be reminded how much she had lost and she burst into tears. Arthur was painfully affected. He had not expected such a scene as this. Was it possible that a woman who, either yielding to the cravings of a voluptuous disposition, or dazzled by an ignoble and false ambition, had consented to become the mistress of a king, was it possible that such a woman could manifest so much true and profound feeling on learning that he, whom she had once loved, was about to wed another, she herself having counselled the alliance, was it possible that he was still so dear to her, and that her own generous nature had suggested that union through a conscientious belief that it would result in his happiness, though she herself sacrificed all her tenderest feelings, in urging him to adopt a course which must necessarily interfere even with the friendship which had conventionally succeeded their love. He had indeed, in the first instance, fancied that the advice which Georgiana had given him arose from the best and kindest motives. But the scene at Carlton House had made him mistrustful of her. Now then, all his good opinion of her revived in its pristine strength, and yet he was bewildered when he thought that one who was susceptible of such noble conduct could have become so suddenly depraved as to consent in a single hour to resign all the purity of her soul in homage to the advances of a royal voluptuary. But Georgiana understood not what was passing in his mind, and she supposed by his embarrassed manner and air of profound thought 
that he felt only for her in regard to the position in which they had been formerly placed. "'Let no thought for me mar your happiness, Arthur, dear Arthur,' she said, in a voice of solemn mournfulness. "'Believe me, I have your welfare sincerely, deeply at heart, far more than perhaps you imagine,' she added, with strange yet unaccountable emphasis. "'At the same time, I am but a poor, weak woman, and cannot altogether restrain my feelings.' I rejoice that you are about to form an alliance with an amiable and beautiful young lady who is so well deserving of your love. At the same time, my memory, oh, too faithful memory, carries me back to those days, indeed to only a few months ago, when my hopes were exalted and my prospects of happiness bright indeed. However, she added hastily, let me not dwell upon that topic and pardon my momentary weakness, Arthur. May God bless you. With these words, Lady Hatfield hurried from the room, and the Earl of Ellingham took his departure, grieved and bewildered by all that had just occurred. If Georgiana be really serious in resigning herself to King George the Fourth, thought Arthur, as he returned in his carriage to Pall Mall, she sacrifices the purity of the most generous the tenderest, the noblest heart with which woman ever was endowed, save and excepting my own well-beloved Esther. End of section 106section 107 of the Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. The Blackamoor's Strange Adventure. It was about nine o'clock in the evening of the same day on which the above-recorded interview took place between the Earl of Ellingham and Lady Hatfield, that the Blackamoor, clad in a very plain, almost a mean attire, sauntered along Paul Mall West, and stopped for a few moments in front of the nobleman's house. He gazed wistfully at the windows, murmured something to himself, uttered a sigh, and passed on. His appearance attracted the notice of two gentlemen who were walking arm in arm in the same direction, and as they examined him more closely by the light of an adjacent lamp, one said to the other, since his majesty has taken it into his head to have a black servant i really think that the very man to suit the purpose is now before us he is a well-made good-looking fellow my dear warren said the gentleman thus addressed you are positively absurd with your notions that you have only to ask in a king's name in order to have how do you know that this man wants this situation he looks as if he did harold replied sir philip warren see he lounges along as if he had no fixed object in view. His clothes do not appear to be any of the best, and his whole demeanor gives me the idea of a lackey out of place. My dear friend, whispered Sir Randolph Harrel, who, like his companion, was one of the king's courtiers, you are really wrong. That man is something far superior to what you conceive him to be. There is even an air of subdued gentility about him. Pooh, pooh, Harrel, interrupted Sir Philip Warren, you do not understand these matters so well as I do. At all events, there is no harm in questioning that fellow, for I should rejoice to be able to fulfill to-night a whim which our royal master only expressed this afternoon, when he saw the French ambassador's splendid black chassis. Well, as you please, Warren, observed Sir Randolph Harrel, but as I do not wish to get myself knocked down for insulting a person of a superior class to what you imagine, I shall leave you to pursue the adventure alone. This conversation has been carried on so close to the Blackmoor that, although the two courtiers had spoken in a very low voice, and had not of course intended that their remarks should be overheard, yet scarcely a word had escaped his ears. Affecting, however, all the time to continue his lounging, listless walk, he took no apparent notice of the gentleman behind him, and even pretended to start with a surprise when Sir Philip Warren, Sir Randolph Harrel, having re-entered Carlton House, tapped him on the shoulder. 
my good man said the courtier in a patronizing fashion i wish to have a few moments conversation with you certainly sir exclaimed the blackamoor touching his hat just like a lackey and assuming the tone and manner of one i thought so i knew i was right exclaimed sir philip rubbing his hands in proof of his satisfaction then attentively scanning the black from head to foot by the aid of the lamp at the door of a neighboring mansion he said in a less excited tone i suspect you my good fellow to be a person in search of employment yes sir interrupted the blackamoor now enjoying the farce that he was playing i should very much like to obtain a good situation and can obtain a first-rate character from my late master the very thing cried sir philip warren hugely delighted at the opportunity of crowing over his friend sir randolph harrell then once more addressing himself to the black he said now what should you think if i proposed to you to enter the household of his most gracious majesty i should be afraid that the offer was too good to be realized sir was the answer delivered in a tone of deep respect although the blackamoor was laughing in his sleeve the whole time it all depends upon me my good fellow said sir philip and if i am satisfied with you the matter is settled immediately but we cannot continue to talk in the open street so follow me to my own apartments in the palace thus speaking the courtier led the way to carlton house the blackamoor following at a respectful distance and saying to himself what object i propose to myself in embracing this adventure i know not it however tickles my fancy and i will go on with it besides having an hour to spare i may as well divert myself in this way as any other accordingly he followed sir philip warren into the royal dwelling and in strict silence did they proceed until they reached an ante-room leading to a suite of apartments which were occupied by the old courtier in the ante-room they stopped for sir philip was immediately accosted by his valet who starting from a seat in which he had been dozing said if you please sir his majesty has sent twice during the last half hour to desire your presence very good gregory exclaimed sir philip i will attend to the royal command this moment and do take the present of hothouse fruit at once to my sister lady maltone her ladyship requires it for her grand supper to-night tell her that i am enabled to send it through the goodness of my royal master yes sir answered the valet and instantly took his departure my good fellow said sir philip warren turning towards the blackamoor you have perceived that it is impossible for me to speak to you at present you must sit down and wait patiently until my return i shall not be very long away but in any case wait sir philip warren having issued these injunctions hastened into the inner apartments to amend his toilette after his evening's stroll and in a short time he came forth again with knee breeches and silk stockings all ready to attend upon the king in passing through the antechamber he repeated his command that the black should await his return and the latter promised to obey when left alone this individual seated himself and gave way to his reflections forgetting for a time where he was at length he started up looked at his watch and found that upwards of half an hour had elapsed since the old courtier had left him he was already wearied of waiting but a natural love of adventure and of the excitement of novelty induced him to remain a little longer to see the issue of the affair which had led him thither he accordingly whiled away another half hour with a newspaper which lay on the table and that interval having passed he began to think of taking his departure without further delay issuing from the ante-room he proceeded along a well-lighted corridor from the extremity of which branched off two smaller passages one to the right and the other to the left the blackamoor was now at a loss which path to pursue for he could not for the life of him remember by which passage the old courtier had led him on his arrival an hour previously he was not however a man at all capable of hesitating to explore even a royal palace in order to find a mode of egress when it did not suit him to wait for the return of his guide and taking the passage to the right he hastened on until he reached a pair of colossal folding doors perfectly recollecting to having passed through those doors on his arrival or at all events through folding doors exactly like them he pushed them open and entered a large ante-room well lighted and containing four marble statues as large as life now thought the blackamoor i am mistaken 
for i do not remember to have seen these statues as i followed the old gentleman into the palace just now and yet i might have passed through this room without noticing them at all events i will recollect those large and splendid folding doors and so i must be right it happened however that he was altogether wrong in the path which he had pursued in order to find an egress from the palace and he was deceived by the fact that at each end of the long passage from the middle of which the corridor branched off there were folding doors of uniform shape size and appearance but conceiving himself to be in the right road he crossed the ante-room and pushed open a door at the farther extremity found himself in a magnificent apartment the furniture of which was of the french fashion of king louis the fifteenth's time the hangings and drapery were of crimson velvet of which material the cushions of the chairs and the sofas were also made several fine pictures by old masters and vast mirrors with elaborately decorated frames graced the walls and the whole was displayed by a rich subdued golden lustre diffused throughout the room by lamps the globes of which were of very thick ground glass it was a mellow light sufficient yet without glare misty without being positively dim and calculated to produce a lulling sensation of voluptuous indolence rather than to dazzle the eyes with a wakeful brilliancy in fact there was altogether something ineffably luxurious in the general appearance of this apartment which was magnificent without being spacious and the perfumed atmosphere of which stole like a delicious linger on the senses the blackamoor forgot for a few moments that he was an intruder or if he remembered the fact he was indifferent to it and though the instant he entered the apartment he saw that he had indeed taken a wrong path yet he could not help advancing farther into it to admire its sumptuous elegance and fine pictures he was thus gratifying his curiosity when he heard voices in the ante-room through which he had just passed and obeying a natural impulse he slipped behind the rich velvet curtains drawn over the immense windows near which he happened to be standing at the moment the door opened and two persons entered the apartment i will await her here warren said one in a commanding and triumphant tone and see that during our interview we are secured against interruption of any kind your majesty shall be obeyed answered sir philip have you any further orders sire none my faithful friend returned the king stay have i the document i gave it to your majesty ere now after having